Good. Okay. Um, morning. So you can probably tell by the time that it says I posted the lecture notes last night, this may not be the most coherent lecture. Fortunately, it's about sorting, which I should, eh, sorting can be as complicated as you want. I mean, there's, um, in that Art of Computer Programming uh, series, the second volume, second volume, third volume, third volume. Uh, no, second volume, I think. It is uh, third volume is semi new. I forget the order. Maybe I have them in the in the box the wrong way around. Um, is sorting and searching. Okay, so I think in there, Knuth says that most of at least back when he wrote that, um, most of the computing time in the world is spent sorting stuff because sorting is a very basic step. If you want to, if you want to do a database chart, you sort. If you want to do, if you want to find stuff, you sort. Uh, actually, at the end of this lecture, we'll be talking about selection, and you can do this faster, but the easiest way, like if you just have a spreadsheet and you want to find something, you want to find the fifth largest element, you can either remember the command to do that, or you can just sort. Right? So a lot of times, people just sort. Good. Um, oh, so when we get to greedy algorithms, uh, which is going to be the next, uh, next week, by the way, remember, uh, no class Monday. Uh, yay, I need a break. I want to, uh, it's Victoria Day, I think, right? It's May 24th. In the syllabus, it says the university is closed. Um, yeah, so I, I have never paid attention to this before because it's the tradition, traditional day for people to go to the cottage. I don't have a cottage. I don't care. I'm an academic. Like, I work Mondays and Wednesdays, and then I usually work weekends. And so normally I don't care about weekends, but I really need the time to finish the chapter on the fast Fourier transform and also get caught up and do some research and, and meet some deadlines and, and write the next section. So I hope that the, the lecture notes for the next for the next lecture don't get posted um, at two o'clock in the morning. Um, so uh, what was I saying? Yeah, so, but for greedy algorithms, um, frequently, if, if you can't figure out what you're supposed to do, um, just if you're sitting in the exam and it says, you know what to do, the first thing, if you can't, if you have no idea what to do, you just write, so we sort the input. What do you sort it by? Like, who cares? Choose something. Um, but usually, if you sort as a first step, it's not that bad. It's not too hard, and frequently, if you think about sorting something, then it, it sort of gets you towards maybe there are frequently only a few things you can sort on. If you consider sorting on any of them, if there is a greedy algorithm, it usually starts by sorting. Okay, um, so uh, you've probably heard, you've probably seen lots of sorting algorithms. I mean, my my first year of um, of computer science, it was sorting algorithms. It was just sorting algorithms to death. Um, and so it was heap sort, merge sort, quick sort, insertion sort, bubble sort, selection sort. Um, there are dozens, dozens of, of sorting algorithms. Um, splay sorts. Uh, I mean, they're they're cool. They have different uh, they have different uses and on different. I'm just going to check this is recording. Yes, um, they have different sort of applications and strengths and weaknesses. Uh, we're not going to go into all of them today because we only have an hour and uh, a half. <laughs> um, Bogo sort. Omega one, omega. I, I think I've heard of this, but I forget. Um, okay, so <clears throat> before we go on, you've probably heard conflicting information about what we can do, how fast we can sort. Um, so um, the uh, you've probably heard that sorting takes O n log n time, and that is true. Now, okay, technically on a word ram, I mean, if 
the numbers are really, really huge, it, you have to be able to read the number. So if you have n numbers, but the numbers are enormous, then, then you can't do it in O of n log n time because it takes you too long just to look at the bits in the number. But um, ignoring pathological cases like that. So yeah, we can do it in O n log n time. Um, but usually what people mean when they say that, you should now appreciate that, that what they mean is it takes omega n log n in the worst case. And whether that's true depends on who you ask and exactly what the circumstances are. Um, for example, there's, I was last night, late at night, I was reading uh, the Stacks Invited Talk by, uh, I think, Torben Hagerup. Um, and no, Michael Thorup, okay, one of those two. Um, and talking about sorting in the word RAM model, and there's, I think it's by Anderson, there's this thing, supposedly simple algorithm that works in N log log N. Okay, we're not gonna get into all of these sneaky bit tricks you can do on the word RAM algorithm. And in general, I think people do say, okay, if you don't have, if, if you can't assume anything about the numbers, then N log N is about the best you can do. Um, but having said that, um, it, there are sort of two special cases that we want to, that I want to talk about first, where you can do better than n log n. Okay, so the first one is just the numbers come from a range. Uh, so you've, you've got these n numbers, which fit each number if it's a machine word, and um, and they come from a range which is linear in n. Okay, so the range is their, in, let, let's suppose they're positive integers. Um, the, the range is of size cn for some constant c. Okay, so you can actually assume that the, the, the range is zero to cn minus one. Okay, so uh, why can you assume that? Well, Okay, if it's, if it's not, then you can, in linear time, you can scan the numbers and find the smallest number. And if the numbers are negative, then you have to add the smallest number to map the smallest number to zero and shift everything. Or if, if the smallest number is positive, then you subtract the smallest number and you shift everything. Um, no, actually you, you still, if the smallest number is negative, you still add it because that's, no, you don't. Uh, you, you don't add it, you still subtract it because that's the effect of adding the, the, the absolute value. Okay, so in both cases, you subtract. I'll have to fix, fix the lecture notes. Um, so you, you can shift to the, so you, so you can shift everything so it's in the range zero to C and minus one. Okay, um, what do you do then? Uh, well, you create an array of, of size Cn with counters for between an array A. Um, okay, so if you just wanna know what the numbers are, so you just want the numbers reported in order, then you can just scan the list, so, of integer counters all initially set to zero. Okay, so you scan the numbers and every time you see a number i, you increment the counter at ai, okay? So now when you scan the whole thing, this takes linear time, um, then you just run through the array and you ignore all the counters which are still zero. And for every counter which is not zero, you say, okay, I saw this many occurrences of i in this, in this set of numbers. How long does this take? This takes linear time, right? Because it's gonna take cn time to like malloc the array, um, assuming natural things about your operating system. It's gonna take linear time to scan the numbers and then it's gonna take linear time to scan through the array. So linear time, okay? 
easy, easy, easy. Um, the only thing is now, what if you, what if these numbers are things like people's ID numbers or phone numbers or something like that? And you actually will have this, so you have keys and records attached to these keys. And so you don't just want to know like how many people have each phone number because that's like, oh, you, you just get back the list of sorted phone numbers. You actually want, um, okay, like I guess you could have like this reverse phone book where you can look up people's phone numbers. Um, then you can look up a phone number and find out who's attached to them. I think this exists. Um, so you, you actually want the numbers, uh, you want to actually have the records with the numbers. So in that case, what you could do is instead of having counters for each, so each AI, is the head of a linked list. Initially null. Um, and when you see something where the key is I, then you go to AI and you insert it in the linked list. <clears throat> now, um, there's a little trick here, right? Because, in, and I explained this in the, in the lecture notes, this is going to be in, in, important for the next step. If you do this naively, what you're going to do is you see AI, you go to, sorry, you see a value I, you go to AI, you insert it in the list, you see another occurrence of value, of, of value I, you go to the same link list, you insert the, so let's say you have, um, you're going to have your array and here you have um, I, so here you have say cell 17, and it's going to point to, well, the first thing you saw was record X, um, X four, okay? But then you saw X uh, 16, which is also, um, an, so X four has key 17, so x4 equals x16 equals 17. So you would go and insert x4 in, in i, right? So you, so you actually have x4, and then here you have a pointer to all of this satellite information, like address, something. And here you have a pointer to all the satellite information for uh, this person 16. Um, and so later when you go back and you're reporting, you say, well, 17, there were two occurrences of 17. And the natural way to do it is to read, right? Because you, you want the insertions to work in constant time into the, into the linked list. So you want to insert at the head of the linked list, unless you, you do something like a doubly linked list and you have a pointer to the tail. This is fine. In which case you couldn't insert at the tail, whatever. Um, but normally you'd be inserting at the head. This is what you what you've learned, and uh, and then you'd come back. And natu the natural thing to do is report x sixteen and then x four. So notice that then the values that have the same the, the 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 records that have the same value get reported in the reverse order they appear in the original or a set of set of keys or numbers or whatever, right? So you'd be doing X16 and then X4. And then if X50 is also 17, you'd, you'd eventually report X50, X16, X4. So this is kind of annoying because it, it does this reversal thing and we don't really want that. So instead what we'd like is if X4 and X16 and X50 are all 17, they're all equal, then we'd like them to be frequently for a lot of things, you'd like them to be in the same order that they occurred in the, the original set. So in which case your, um, your stable sorting 
So for a stable sort, what you got is um, if x i is less than or equal to x j, and i i is less than j, then x i precedes x j in the sorted set. Uh, okay, I'm saying set. Some you frequently want to sort multi sets, not just sets, whatever. Um, it was a late night. Um, I could get this right if my life depended on it, but, but okay. So if Xi is strictly less, less than um, Xj, then, um, then Xi precedes Xj. And if it's equal, yeah, it's actually what we want to say. Okay, forget the less than or equal. Just, so we to be completely explicit, if xi is less than xj, then xi precedes xj in the sorted set in the output. Okay, let's say in the output. So if, if xi is less than xj, then it precedes xj. That means it's sorted. And if they're equal and i is less than j, so, so it was earlier before, then it's still earlier. OK. Um, so that's stable sorting. Now, so that was, that's a procedure called counting sort, OK? Because you're, if you don't worry about these linked lists, you're just, count, you're just incrementing counters. You just get the count of how often each thing occurs, OK? Um, now, uh, that's kind of, that case, I'm not sure that comes up that often in practice, where you're, you're working in a small range. So for example, if, if you're sorting a permutation, a permutation is the, the almost uh, one to n, then it's easy to do it in linear time because you just use, you just sort of put them in the right boxes, right? in fact. You could just say, oh, well, if it's one to n, then I know it's one to n, then I'll just output the numbers one to n. I don't even have to look. Um, but this is where you need, you care about records and satellite information. OK. Um, so now let's, the, 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 the case that we look at now is, is slightly more frequent. Uh, can you read the, OK, if, if xi is less than xj, then xi precedes xj in the output. That's just saying it's sorted. It's not saying it's stably sorted, it's just saying it's sorted. Um, so there is a way to like combine these two statements, but I'm, I'm not going to, 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 to do that online. Um, so then, um, now let's worry about the case where uh, the set of numbers is drawn for a, from a range that's polynomial in N. Okay, so now before counting sort works if I'm leaving these on because I want them later. Um, I actually wrote something on the board in preparation for the class. Um, so counting sort works when Counting sort works when you have a range which is of size cn for some constant c. So now, uh, suppose we have n integers from a range of, and they fit in each one fits in a constant number of machine words of size n to the c for some constant c. All right, so it's polynomial. Again, you can do this mapping to zero. So you, without loss of generality, n to the c 
it's it's it means so for it's some polynomial in n so c is a constant so it could be i mean five okay it could be 16 something like that but some constant um and this is going to affect the coefficients in the running time some constant um some constant exponent uh and so instead of being c times n for some constant c so it's a linear size now it's polynomial size okay um by in polynomial of n it's like n squared n to the fifth n to the 17th right um it's it's like n to some constant um So if n equals five, no. Um, if so, if n equals ah, okay, I see. So if n equals five, and and c is equal to five, then you have five numbers that come from a range of size at most twenty-five. Okay, so maybe the numbers come from the range forty-seven to. 72 or 71, I think. Um, so, so if you take the smallest, if, if you have n numbers and you say, okay, I'm gonna assume that everything, everything is supposed to come from a range of size at most n to the five, and I have five numbers, then the, the, the gap between the, the big, smallest number and the biggest number is at most 24, right? Because then you have like uh, this one and like the, the total size of the range is 25, okay? Um, so the gap between the smallest and the biggest number is not too big. It's polynomial in N. And then um, again, you can do this trick where you just zip through, you scan, you find the smallest one, you subtract, and you can assume that everything that you're working in uh, the range is range is so there's this assume without loss of generality w ball it looks like a math operation but it's without loss of generality uh range you can assume that it's one zero to n to the c minus zero by doing this mapping trick okay now i'm not actually going to do that in the example so um now uh, how do you deal with this? Well, assume that like we're working on a computer. So assume the numbers are written in binary. Um, so what you're going to do is you're going to take, um, basically you're gonna do radix sort of, but you're not gonna do it bit by bit. You're gonna do it in radix sort in a, in, a, in a special base that we're gonna choose now. So we're going to choose base b equals um, ceiling of log n, right? And then, so each number, and okay, I'm writing numbers, let's assume they're integers. Um, so each number can be viewed as a sequence, well, as a C digit number in base B. Okay. So why? Well, we said that the numbers are up to uh, size C, or sorry, up to size about N to the C. So that means um, that in total they're about, so if you take the log of them, it's about C log N is the largest, right? Because we mapped to this, to this range. So about C log N. So if you're saying B is about ceiling log N, then any of these numbers, you can view it as a C digit number in base B, right? Where B is, um, is, is like B, uh oh, okay. Yeah. 
Just restart this. Reset, start. Okay. Um, is this clear? Six questions, but is the last one? No, everything is clear. Okay. Um, so um, you're sort of breaking, you're, you're taking this, uh, you're taking these numbers, which have, you can imagine them of, as having about C, um, C log n digits. And you're viewing each block of about login digits at, together as a, a character, as, as a digit, as one digit. Instead of like B bits, it's a digit. So for example, in this example, um, it, it turns out that I'm gonna view it in octal, right? So if, if B is three, I'm working in octal. Yes. Um, if B is four, I'm working in hex, okay? Uh, and then if B is more than four, I'm not sure how I would actually go about writing the things on the board. Um, so um, now, so you can view these as <coughs> N C digit numbers in base B. We're talking about um, base 10, yes. Yes. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I'm not sure that doesn't, yeah, okay, that doesn't work when I'm taking integer B to B um, because 10 isn't a, an integer power of two, but, um, but okay. So now I, I have these, um, each, I have these N numbers. Each is a C digit number in base B. Now I read it. Sorry. Okay. Now, how long is this going to take? So, how do you let's consider radix or instead of like just you know magic that somehow works? Let's think about we view it, we view these numbers as a matrix, right? Which has n rows and c columns. And in each column of the matrix, it's got the the, the digits in the, um, oh, I think I reused C in, in the lecture notes for two things. That's probably bad. Um, but okay, in, in the, um, the uh, ith row and the jth column, you have the jth digit of the ith number, right? Now, what you're gonna do is take each column and you want to, to, to radix sort the numbers, you're going to, working from right to left, you're going to take the columns and you're going to do counting sort on the column, right? And how long is that going to take? Well, uh, what is the range of numbers in the column? It's between zero and two to the B minus one. And that, B is ceiling log n, which is at most, which is less than log n plus one. So you've got a range, the numbers in each column are in a range linear in n, right? So when you, when you, when you, uh, you counting sort each column and when you, as you're counting sort, there's gonna be an example. This is, I, I it's also, there's an example with both, <laughs> the same example. But okay, so you're going to counting sort each column, All right? So the column of digits, so the, the, the rightmost digits in the numbers, their numbers, uh, they're B bit numbers, which means, and B is ceiling log n, which means they're in the range zero to two. So uh, the numbers, well, the digits, in each column are numbers in the range are, well, they're B-bit numbers, 
So they're in the range zero to two to the B minus one. And two to the B minus one is two to the ceiling log N, this is a log N, um, minus one, which is less than two um, to the log N plus one minus one. So this is less, um, this is equal to uh, two N minus one, okay? So it's from a range which is linear in N. Okay, each of the columns, the number in each column is linear in N. So you can counting sort in linear time, okay? Now, when you counting sort the, number in the, the numbers in the columns, you, um, three, are people asking about, okay. Um, so you can do counting sort on the columns. And when you, when you sort the numbers, you're also moving the whole, you're not just moving the numbers around, uh, you're not just moving the digits around, you're moving the whole numbers around, which are these rows in this matrix, okay? So, now I'm going to show you this, this, the fact that if you counting sort stably and you work from right to left, then you actually end up with the, the numbers sorted. How long does this take? Well, it takes you linear time on each column. How many columns are there? C. But C is a constant. So you sort in linear time. So now we have this theorem that if you have n numbers from a range which is polynomial in n, then you can sort them and they all fit in a constant number of machine orders. Then and then they each fit in a constant number of machine orders. Then you can sort them in linear time. Okay, so that actually comes up quite a lot. And, um, and so radix sort is magic and it breaks lower bounds, but not really because you have this assumption about the range. Okay, um, so let's just do an example uh, because I'm sure my, ex my explanations may be clearer in the lecture notes, except that I did write them at two in the morning. So maybe not. Let's just see if I can get away with leaving this on here so that you can check it while I'm, while I'm going. Okay, so let's assume that we have these numbers x1 through x7, and these are binary numbers on uh, 2, 4, 6. Wait, really? 2, 4, 6, 8. Eight digits? I thought these were on seven digits. Okay. Um, anyway, it looks like they're on eight digits. 2, 4, 6, 8. Yeah. Okay. Um, why did I choose a power of two as a number? You don't have to. It works anyway. Um, so it's on eight digits, and now we have seven numbers. Um, and so let's take, uh, so B equals ceiling log seven equals three. Um, so we're going to break these into columns. I didn't draw these very evenly. Three, three. Okay, and then these three. Oh yeah, okay, it does work here because that's why I thought it was odd because it's um, it's a power of eight, it's eight, but it's not a multiple of three. Okay. So I look here and here and here and here. And not like that, like this. Okay. So we're going to break them into, um, like viewing this as sort of metric, we, we, we break them into chunks of size three, and then we write, so this is uh, four and one, it's five, this is just a one, this is a two, so two, one, five. So we write it in octal, okay? So frequently people, people will write 
sometimes to indicate that this is a binary number and not just a decimal number with lots of ones and zeros in it, they will write two. And then to show that this is not 215, this is an octal number, they will write um, uh, parentheses around it with a subscript eight. Actually, I'm not sure people usually do that, but I have seen it done. Um, Knuth does it, I think, in our computer program. Um, so now we have um, octal numbers uh, with three um, octal digits. So everything, unfortunately, there are no, there's no seven. Okay, but it's everything is in the range zero to seven. So zero to um, uh, at most two to n, I think. Right. So, so all of these digits are from a range which is linear in the number of numbers. Can you define stable? Stable means that if the um, if two numbers are equal in the input, then the order in the out. If if two numbers are equal, if two two elements of the input are equal, their order in the output is the same as their order in the input. Right. So so when we had x four, x sixteen, and x fifty are all equal to seventeen in the output, we say x four, x sixteen, x fifty. That's why. Oh, I forgot to say how you do this. When you when you're going through the maybe I maybe I forgot when you're going through the array for a counting sort. Sorry, I'm a bit short on sleep. Um, uh, when you're going through the array and counting sort, you have to, before you report each link list, you go to the end of the link list and you report it backwards. And that way it's stable. Okay, so that's how you make counting sort stable. Um, you can do other things. Okay, how do you get number seven? Is it log base two seven? So, so, oh, so B, um, seven here is the number of numbers. Okay, it's the, it's, the, it's the number of input elements, right? So there's, okay, yes. Three is log, ceiling of log base, the log base N. B is a log base, log N, ceiling of log N. Okay, so, so yes, it's uh, because this way, remember, if, if we choose B like this, then two to, what are each of these numbers? Well, it's about two to the b, and two to the b, two to the log n is, is about n, and then you have the ceiling, so to make everything integer, so you, you end up with this two, but it's still a linear range. How is it base eight? Um, because I'm, b is three, so uh, two to the three, and so, so a three bit binary number is between zero and seven, which is a base eight digit. Okay. Um, so, uh, right. So what we do, and then we, to, to radix sort, so, so I'm just gonna erase this. Now, the trick is you, you can do, there are most significant bit first radix sorts, but people actually, which I send the notes, if you, if you radix sort starting at the left, then if you get interrupted halfway through, then at least you've done something. I mean, the numbers which are much smaller than, if, if, if some number is much smaller than another number, then this number comes before. Um, so it's sort of so partly sorted. But um, people prefer frequently for implementation purposes, they prefer working right to left. So least significant bit. Although in this case, we're not working bit by bit, we're working digit, octal digit by octal digit. Oct, maybe? I don't know if an octal digit is called an oct, but whatever. So what are we gonna do? And the important thing is that we have to do, so we're gonna counting sort each, each um, column and we're gonna do it stably. And the reason for that is if you do an, uh, a least significant bit first, 
uh, rating sort and you do it stably, then you don't have, you can forget about any column that you've already processed because it won't get messed up. Okay. Whereas if you work, if you work from uh, left to right, then when you process some column, unless you do like partitioning and buckets and stuff like this, then you tend to mess up what you've already done. And if you work from right to left and you don't use stable sorting on the columns, then you, again, you mess up what you've already done. But let's just see that this works um, when, uh, when we do it stably. So here we're going to get one, one, zero, it's first. And then, okay, well, here we have a zero. So we write down one, one, zero, it's, it, it's small. So then we have a one, so we write three, five, one. Then this two, we have two twos, but it's important that we're gonna write this one first. It comes first in the input, so it's gonna come first in the output. So it's gonna be zero, six, two, and then one, one, two. If this doesn't work, I'm gonna be really unhappy. And then we have no threes. We have one, four, one, six, four, and then we have two fives. And so again, because it's stable, it has to be two, one, five, followed by two, four, five. Okay. So this is uh, stably sorted on the last column. Now, um, I'm just going to check that this is recording again. Um, okay, I'm a bit paranoid about that. What happened here? I, I took the, the rightmost column, the least significant column, and I, I did counting sort on it in linear time, in O of n time. And um, I rearranged the numbers in the order of their least significant digit, and I did it stably. So this, this two comes before, this 0, 6, 2 comes before 1, 1, 2. So this one comes, this two comes before this two. This five, oh, unfortunately, we don't have any cases where there's, where this is, this could be like two, four, five, and then we, we switch it. Okay, that's kind of annoying. Oh. But it's just something that, it, a problem that would get solved anyway, but you're not gonna see it get solved. Um, but okay, so now we took the, the last column, the least significant column, we rated it sorted on that. Now we're gonna take the second column and we're gonna rate it sort on that. So there are, there's no zeros, there are three ones, and we're gonna stably sort. So it's gonna be one, one, zero, one, one, two, and then two, one, five. And then we have no twos, no threes, one, four, which is two, four, five. And then one, five, so three, five, one. And then two sixes, and we do it stably, so it's zero, six, two, and then one, six, four. Now, the important thing is here, if we didn't do it stably, we could accidentally swap this order, which would mess up this, the, 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 the relation that depends on this one. So these are tied on one, one, zero, one and one and one and one. But because we've already sorted here, if these are equal, then the tie is broken on these two, okay? And then we just do um, the right column, the, sorry, the, the left column, the, the, the leftmost column, the first column, and we're going to stably sort. So there's one zero, so it's zero, six, two, and there are three ones, and we do it in stable order. So it's one, one, zero, one, one, two, one, six, four, one, one, zero, one, one, two, and then two, one, five, two, four, five. And then there's a, uh, and then there's a three, five, one, and yay, we have actually sorted the things. Okay, how long did that take? Well, it took about three rounds of a linear process and three, um, 
is, is the size of the numbers, which I didn't map to zero, in order, but okay, so it's sort of the, the, the number of, of um, it's the size of the numbers divided by, uh, the number of bits in the numbers divided by log n. And so we said uh, the numbers are bounded by a polynomial. So this is going to be like C. So header for each grouping. I'm not sure what you mean. Um, so, so, so in this case, C is going to be, we've got three columns, three is a constant. So three is, is this C and it's, it's, it's basically log base n of the, the size of the range. Okay, let's see what the header means. Okay, like a title, how sorted. Okay, so this one is just these numbers written in Oxl. This is this, but sorted on, um, on the least significant digit. And then this, so it goes from here to here, sorted on the least significant digit stably. Here to here, sorted on the second least significant digit stably. And then here to here, sorted on the most significant digit stably. And why is it 3n? The time is 3n. Um, yes, so, so we're, we have three columns. And each, well, we have three sets. We break each number into three sort of blocks of B bits. Each bit, each block is a digit between um, zero and N. Okay. Uh, yes, okay. Um, it's in the lecture notes and tutorials and office hours. Right now we have to get going because we have to get through the through comparison basically. Um, so that was radix sorting. I just wanted to see you. Uh, I just wanted you to see sort of as a reminder for later when I go through. Um, and you think, but oh, wait, I've heard the radix sort can do that. Mm. Um, radix sort and counting sort work by looking sort of inside the number. Right? We're breaking the numbers up into bits. We're we're looking at the bits, whereas comparison based sorts don't. You don't get to look inside the number. With counting sort, we're doing direct addresses. And we're, we're actually sort of looking at the numbers as pointers, as indices into an array. And comparison based in the comparison model, you're not allowed to do that. The comparison model, all you're allowed to do is take, a, take two numbers and say, is this one bigger than this one? Or bigger or equal, less, whatever. So, um, for the rest of the lecture, we're going to be in the comparison based model. Okay, we get rid of all of these. I'm pretty sure on the syllabus, there's a link to Antti Laxelman's um, programming, competitive programming book. And I'm pretty sure he's going to do radix sort in that. This also radix sort is in the introduction to algorithms and it's all over the web. Okay. So um, now let's talk about comparison based sorting. Comparison based sorting, um, like you, you, you get to pick two, choose these two numbers and then just compare them. Now, usually this is weaker then as long as the numbers fit in a constant uh, number of machine words in the RAM model, you can do a comparison in constant time. So um, the comparison model is sort of weaker. We can do less in the comparison model, assuming that everything fits in constant number of machine words. Um, so that means that if we can prove an upper bound in the comparison model, it also holds in the word RAM model. If you can prove a lower bound in the word RAM model, it sort of also holds in the comparison model, except some people let you, let you do computa other computations that don't involve comparisons for free. Um, so you, do, you have to be a little bit careful how you interpret things. Um, but let's talk about various sorting algorithms. Um, I'm just going to check what 
I have these notes. Da, 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 da. Am I saying everything? Yeah, cut through this long example. So first, um, yeah, okay. So theorem, we can sort if if everything's from a polynomial range, we can sort linear time. Ah. Is that going to focus? Why is it not? Well, maybe it focused. Um, okay. So the first thing we're going to see a lower bound that says that in general, in, in the comparison model, um, in the comparison model, okay, reset this, start this again. You can't do better than um, n log n comparisons in general. Okay. Um, and there's a figure in the notes, yeah. So which is uh, a decision tree. So suppose you have some algorithm A which works on comparisons. It's going to take n numbers, n things, and it's not allowed to look inside the things. All it's allowed to do is we can as assume the things are distinct. It's a set, so so that the elements are distinct. It can just hold up two elements and say x and y is x less than y is x greater than y. Okay, x equals y doesn't happen because they're distinct. Um, so in the notes, there's this cute little decision tree. Also in the textbook, there's a cute little decision tree um, saying, okay, here is, I drew a decision tree last night for if you're sorting um, three elements. Um, <clears throat> here, so you compare x1 and x2, and then if, if x1 is smaller than x2, then you compare x3 and x2 and x3, and da, da. And so, okay, however, the even if the algorithm is randomized, you can say, okay, fix its source of random bits to be something, and then we can analyze it. Now, imagine this decision tree. So how many leaves does this decision tree have? Well, it has to have at least one leaf for each possible ordering of these n elements, right? So it has to have, so the decision tree for alg algorithm A sorting n elements, has at least n factorial leaves, right? Because at each leaf, it says, okay, this is the order, and there are n factorial possible orders. So it's binary, right? Because at each, each time you get a comparison, you get a yes or no answer. Is this smaller than this? Right? So it's a binary tree. Binary tree with n factorial leaves, at least n factorial leaves, has height omega log. So this is actually, um, okay, I don't even need the omega yet, at least log and factorial. Ooh, what's this? We know this. We saw this in the last lecture, one of the, one of the previous lectures. We know how, we know what that looks like because of Sterling's formula, right? Which it was the last lecture because I was saying, look, Sterling's formula includes big O notation and this doesn't mean it's bad. <laughs> so um, actually in the, in the lecture notes, I was having fun because I was saying, oh, and here I'm, I'm using omega and it's a worst case and it's O oh, and it's the best case. And that. Actually, we get to that in just a minute. Um, so what is log n factorial by Sterling's formula? Um, so this is, oh, I should do this. 
so so uh, no, we didn't actually see log n factorial. We saw ln n factorial, um, which is uh, ln n factorial over ln two. Am I getting this? Yeah, right. So log n factorial equals um, one over log e. That's the second. I can do this, but uh, not while I'm standing in front of you. So wait, I have this as being one over. Uh, I have this as ln n log, uh, yeah. All oh, right, so this should be ln two. Um, of, and then by solving formula, it's n ln n minus n plus, oh, it doesn't, it only changes the constant factor anyway. Log n, and this is all, um, Omega and okay. so Omega, yay, Omega. Um, so we know that the decision tree has some long path, okay, right? Some leaf has to be deep. That means that, and in, in fact, that if we if we even if it has multiple copies, if it has multiple leaves for the same ordering, which it shouldn't, um, then uh, then we can just considering the, consider the, the the highest leaf for each one. There are still n factorials, and that means one of them has to be d. So there has to be some ordering where any leaf corresponding to that ordering has to be of depth at least omega at least is omega. It has to be of depth omega n log n. That means that in the worst case, for, for any comparison-based algorithm, there is some permutation of the n elements for which it does omega n log n comparison. Okay, good. So we have a lower bound for comparison-based sorting. Um, where did the eraser go? Okay, that's okay. So now, does that mean we always? Me. Ah, ah, um, does that mean we always need, if we're doing comparison-based sorting, we always need omega, um, omega and log n? No, it doesn't. For example, now some algorithms. Maybe, for example, selection sort is always uh, it's not is always going to use about n squared. Now you've probably heard um, insertion sort. Most people know how to do insertion sort. Um, if you take insertion sort, it also has a worst case that's n squared. That's like omega n squared. It's actually theta n squared. Um, and you can see this because if you if you imagine taking insertion sort. I'm not going to finish on time on one, two, three, four, up to n. What's it going to do? It's going to take uh, the one and it's going to put it in a list. And then it's going to take two and it's going to compare two to one. And then it's going to put it next. And then it's going to take three and it's going to compare it to one and two and it's going to put three next. And so when it does this, for each, for the number i, it's going to do i minus one comparisons, right? And uh, so you're going to get zero plus one plus two plus three plus 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 plus, plus n minus one. And this is theta n squared. But now let's consider insertion sort. If you give it the numbers n, n minus one, n minus 2, n minus 3, 2, 1. Okay. So now what's it going to do? It's going to take n away. It's going to put n here. It's going to take n minus 1. It's going to comp compare it to n. And it's going to put n minus 1 here. 
And then it's taken it away. It's going to take n minus 2 and compare it to n minus 1 and put n minus 2 in front of n minus 1. And then it's going to take n minus 3 and compare it to n minus 2 and put n minus 3 in front of n minus 2. So for each of these numbers, it's going to do one comparison. So then it's going to run in linear time. So actually, the insertion sort's worst case is when you give it a sorted list. And insertion sort's best case is when you give it a list that's backwards. And in its best case, it takes linear time. OK, so best case, we generally don't care about best case because it's not that informative. Um, we're more interested in things like average case. Well, worst case, we really like worst case. Average case is like me. Um, some people care about um, notions of pre-sortedness. So I have a friend, Jeremy, who um, he, he considered, for example, if, if, the, if the input can be broken up into a small number, of, can be partitioned to a small number of sorted subsequences, then you can sort it faster. This will actually come up late in some other, I'm gonna use this later, several times actually. Um, maybe it's an exercise. Yes, yes, probably it's an exercise. That would be cool. Um, so now let's talk about my new algorithm, no sort. <laughs> okay. Well, okay, almost most stuff has a good best case. Um, Except like selection sort, which which has its worst case and its best case is always theta n squared. But but usually it's it's usually for most algorithms there's some input for which is pretty good. Um, so that's that's not saying um, okay merge sort. So let's talk about merge sort. So we've seen that uh, we can actually. So it's not hard to do. So insertion sort you can show that it's it's uh, quadratic. Selection sort is quadratic. Let's see that merge sort is um, is uh, n log n in the worst case. Okay. So recall it for merge sort. What we do, we have a, a list of a, 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 an array of numbers, and we we, we have a one to a n. So let's all oh, let's say s because we used a for the algorithm. S one to n because later I was using s as the subarray. Um, we choose. Uh, we divide it into s one to floor of n over two and a much and s um say floor of n over two plus one n and then we recursively sort these and then um and then we merge them. How do we merge them? I wrote the, the, the code in the lecture notes. So I was saying, assume that you take these two subarrays, you want to merge them. Conceptually, you append infinity to the end of either one of them. And then you just, uh, you, you just have a, a, a um, you know, three, three, count, uh, three pointers, i, j, k. And so it's like i equals zero, j equals zero, k equals zero. And then while, um, um, so it's, you have S1 by uh, mod equal infinity or S2J mod equal infinity. So remember, uh, conceptually, we've appended infinity at the end of either of these things. Um, if S one I, there might be a mistake in this. I haven't actually tried it, but is less than S two J. Then, um, so this is going to come up in the next lecture when we discuss some other stuff. Um, then S S is the output. S K equals S1i, i plus plus, k 
k plus plus. And then you say else um, sk equals s2j k plus plus k plus plus. So it's just saying end, end if, and what. So it's just saying, okay, look at the first two, look at the two numbers and take the one that's smallest and put it in the output array. Okay. Um, what's written inside while? Everything under while. Yeah, so, so the while is closed here. So this is if else, and this is while. Um, so how long does this take? By 15 minutes. Yeah. Um, well, how long does the merging take? It takes linear time. Okay. Uh, unless you mean the condition. So I'm just saying that um, as long as I haven't got to the end of both lists, S one I not equal to infinity or S S two J not equal to infinity. That could be a bug in this. Um, Okay, so at each, at um, the recurrence is going to be, I'm going to TN, I'm going to sort two. Now, this is why in the, the master theorem, it's nice that it says, yeah, we ignore the floors and ceilings on N over B, right? Remember that from, from last time? We say we're going to, we have two sub problems of size n over 2. And then it takes us linear time, like n time, to do the merge. And we look at that and we're like, oh, that's easy. That's that's case. That's the second case of the master theorem. That's when the splitting up and the subproblem shrinking is about balanced. So that means that the, the amount of work at each level of this recursion tree is about equal. So um, remember that said then Tn is theta log base B, uh, n to the log base B of A log n. Okay. So this is just um, what is A to what is B to. So this is one. So this is equal theta n log n. Okay. So merge sort is n log n. We know that recurrence fn is big. Thing. Yeah, because this yes, um, because here, yeah, the um, f of f of I got it. I, I said this in the lecture notes. N is so f of n equals n equals theta um, n to the log base b of a. This is this is just log base two of two. So this is one, so this is theta n. Yes. Thank you for reminding me about that. Um, okay, so ah, we have 12 minutes for quick sort and quick select. Yay. Um, mm, this is not really enough time. So merge sort n log n in the worst case, easy by the master theorem. So now, um, what about, have people seen quicksort? I assume you've seen merge sort. You know quicksort, right? Okay. So quicksort, what's the, what's the worst case for quicksort? So quicksort, you like, usually you, you like pseudo randomly pick a pivot. Right. You have this, you have S one to N and you pick a pivot and you partition stuff into the numbers smaller than the pivot and the numbers bigger than the pivot. Um, and so in the worst case, you, however the numbers are mixed up, you pick the smallest one or the biggest one. 
But say you pick the smallest one. You then partition, you spend linear time partitioning, and all you've got is, is this huge partition that has n minus one things in it, and this is your pivot. And then if you're very unlucky, the next time you pick the, the smallest remaining element and you partition. So this means if you if you consider the recursion tree, it's degenerate. Okay, it just like stabs down, like you've got um, that the trace is 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 a degenerate tree and it's very bad and it's very deep. It's linear depth. Um, and you're doing linear work at each level. So it's n squared in the worst case. Oh, it's theta n squared in the worst case. Why do people use this? Why do we teach this? Um, because you have to be very unlucky for that to happen. So how unlucky do you have to be? Well, let's imagine we have some S prime is S sorted. So we have S prime. Let's imagine it as this, this rectangle. Okay. And this is a quarter. This is the first n over, well, let's say that this point is n over four, and this, this is three n over four. Okay. Now let's suppose that I'm going to consider myself lucky if my pivot, now remember S prime is sort of, if my pivot is in like the middle half of S prime, we don't actually sort the things before we choose the pivot. Although if we have time, I will mention something like that. Maybe we're probably not going to have time. Um, so, but I'm going to conceptually, because I'm choosing it pseudo randomly, so the chances of me ending up in the choosing an element from S that would belong in the middle half if the things were sorted is about half, right? And the chance of me choosing it at one end is also half. Okay? So I'm going to consider myself, it's, it's a lucky pivot, it's a lucky choice of pivot if it's in the middle half, and it's an unlucky choice of pivot if it's at one of the ends. Okay? Now, Let's, let's consider it, it doesn't actually make the algorithm run faster. If I decide that I choose a pivot and then I do the partition, and if I do the partition and um, the, two, the partitions are very uneven, so one of the partitions has more than three quarters, then I don't like that pivot. I take everything, merge it back together and do it over and pick a new pivot, okay? So if I choose in if I choose somebody here, then um, neither of the, the neither of the partitions can be three quarters, right? So when I part if I choose if I choose a pivot from the middle half, then the biggest well the yeah the biggest it can be is like n over uh, three quarters of n minus one, okay. So there could be like off by one errors here. But, um, but I, have to, I have to choose an unlucky pivot in order for the partition to be very skewed. And the problem with that, the probability of that happening, if I choose it pseudorandomly correctly, is, is at most a half. So, okay, if I'm going to, I'm going to choose a pivot, I'm going to do the partition. And if, I, if I've got a good partition, then I'm just going to keep going. And if I've got a bad partition, one of the is one of the pieces is more than three quarters. I'm going to choose a new pivot and repartition. Okay. So how so to do this partition takes me linear time. So how much time do we expect to take before we get a good pivot? Well. The chances of the, the chance of me choosing a good pivot on the first on the first try. So what are the chances of me of me using one try, choosing one pivot and it's a lucky pivot and I just keep going? Well, that's uh, the chances of one try are what's sorry, what's the expected number of tries? 
I'm just, I'm going to cut one step out. So it's the probability is one half that I use one try. I pull, I choose one pivot. And then the probability um, is it's a quarter, right? Oh, so if the, because why is it a half? The probability is um, a half that I just choose a good pivot. To choose, if I wanted to have exactly two tries, it means I had to choose a bad pivot the first time, and then I choose a good pivot. So that's a probability a half and a probability a half. So probability a quarter. I actually went in a bit more detail in the lecture notes. So that's a quarter times two, plus an eighth times three, plus a sixteenth times four, plus blah, blah, blah. So this is sum over i greater than or equal to one of i over two to the i. How? Okay, we're going to get four. I'm going to let this thing keep running, and then it's just going to lose the end of the. And maybe I'm going to have to edit these videos. I have five minutes left. Four, four minutes left. Okay. Okay. So, uh, and this is two. Okay. Trust me. It's just two. It's a sum of an arithmetical geometric series. And we may have seen this in high school. I don't know if that's true. Um, can't remember high school was a long time ago. Um, so this is two. So that means that the expected number of pivots I try before I can go forward and, and continue my recursion is two. Okay, which that, and that means that the expected amount of work I do at each node of, my, at, at each node of the recursion tree is linear in the size of the subarray I'm processing. If you again, imagine the recursion as a tree, at each node, each node is the subarray that we're recursing on. And then, so the expected amount of, of effort we're gonna spend at that subarray is, uh, uh, is linear in the size of the subarray. Okay, when you consider that, so now um, the, the depth, um, so the, okay. what is the height of the tree? Well, if, if we have to, if we, we won't go on, we won't, we, we keep re-choosing pivots until we get one in the middle half, that means that neither of the partitions is greater than three quarters. So that means that if you, and if you take N, and then you take three quarters in, and then you take nine sixteenths in, and you go down, how far can you go before you get down to one? Well, you're going to get log four thirds n. So this is your, the height of your tree. It's logarithmic height. If you consider all of the leaves, oh, this is a tricky argument for two minutes. Um, if you consider each leaf, right? So each leaf is a single element. Um, all it sort of adds a constant amount to the work done at the subarrays at each of the ancestors in the tree. Okay, right? Because at each subarray, you're doing a linear amount of work in the size of the subarray, and that means for each element in the subarray, you're doing a constant amount of work. So if you consider the path down to a leaf in each of those subarrays you're doing a constant amount of work for that leaf. So the, um, then there's this magic phrase by linearity of expectation, which just means basically the, um, the expectation of a sum is the sum of the expectations. And that means if, if we have all these expectations and we, we, we sum everything up, um, so each leaf, what is sort of the expected um, contribution to the work, it's its depth, it's linear in its depth, and, and so you have n leaves, there are depth log n, you get expected time and log n. 
This is in the textbook anyway. I wanted to present it this way because we will do this again in the next class. Um, now we are almost out of time. If people need to go, um, you can go. I'm just going to keep recording and um, record. Um, uh, how to do quick select because this is sort of a, a bonus thing. Um, once you've seen quick sort, quick select is not so hard. It just, and it's in the lecture notes and it's also in the textbook. Um, but so quick select is, if, if you need to go, please leave. Um, but, but so quick select is, if I ask you, if I give you an unsorted array of numbers and I ask you to find the kth number in sorted order, so this, remember at the beginning, I said, if you have, um, if you're lazy and you have a spreadsheet open, you want to find the kth, uh, the kth number in sorted order in some column, there is actually like in Excel or, or um, open office or whatever, there's a command to do this, but <laughs> I can never remember what it is. So I just, you know, you can just select everything and sort it um, and then choose the kth. But, Suppose you, suppose you actually care about efficiency. Um, can you find the kth uh, element in sorted order without sorting everything? So, so in better than n log n time in the worst case. And you, at least in expectation, you can. Because uh, what you would do is this quick select, what you would do in practice is this quick select algorithm, which is, like quicksort, hence the name, you pick a pivot. Right? And now you partition the, the set, uh, the input into the two halves, larger than the pivot and smaller than the pivot. Now, if you're looking for the, in the, in the, in the course notes, I give the example like 197th. Um, you're looking for the 197th. number. Uh, the pivot, uh, you pick the pivot, and let's say um, 103 oh, of, of 300 numbers. It actually doesn't matter that of the 300 in this case, but pick the pivot. Say 103 numbers are smaller than the pivot. And let's say three numbers equal pivot, including the pivot itself. So now, what are you? Well, you don't care about these 103 numbers, right? Because they're, you know, they're too small. They're, they're of no interest to you. So what you do is you say, um, I'm now, I'm not looking for the 197th number in the stuff that's larger than the pivot. I'm gonna take the stuff that's smaller than the pivot and the stuff that's equal to the pivot, and I'm gonna subtract it from the rank I was aiming at. So now what I actually want is now we want, 91st number in partition larger in, in well in the subset say larger than today. So um, now the cool thing is running uh, quick select is like doing the analysis of quick select is just like doing a single branch of that recursion tree. Because in each, at, at each step, if you're lucky, or if you do this fussy quick sort thing where you, you don't go on until you get a good pivot, 
you're going to be throwing away a constant fraction of the stuff. So you're only going to do a logarithmic number of, so you're going to go down a logarithmic, um, a logarithmic depth, but um, you're definitely, you're going to go from N to three quarters, at, at most about three quarters N to about nine sixteenths N to about 27 sixty-fourths of N. And so you're shrinking by a factor of a quarter at each time. And so if you, you, uh, you do the sum, it's actually going to be linear. So quick select, you can do, you can find the kth largest number, the kth number in sorted order in linear time in expectation. Now I finished the course and I was talking about, um, uh, you can make that deterministic. And it's a little bit tricky, but I'd like people to see it. Um, I'm not gonna go into the details. They are in the book or you can find them online as famous algorithm by a load of famous people, like five famous people. So what you do, okay, I'll leave that on. You take S and you, you, you break it up into quintuples, right? So just arbitrarily, you just take the five, first five things, second five things, third five things, right? And you break it up into, let's, see, let's pretend that N is a, is a multiple of five. You break it up into about N over, break S into N over five, five tuples. So quintuples. Okay, find the median in each five tuple. How long does that take? That, oh, come on, that's, that's easy. Like finding the median in a five tuple is, is constant time, right? It's like five things, that's easy. Sorting five things. Um, so this is going to take linear time in O n time time. Now, take the medians, take the, take the n over 5 medians. Okay, so now we're going to call this, let's call this m. Okay, this said m. Recursively, find Um, say set M, find the median of M. Okay, what does that mean? It means um, now, we, now we're gonna select the middle element. We're assuming that we have some selection thing and we're breaking it down and now we're getting a case which is only one fifth the size. And we assume we work, we, we, we deal with M. Now, here's where the magic is. M is, a, the, the median of M is a good pivot. Why? Because if you, if you, if you consider <clears throat> one, two, three, four, five, four, one, two, three, four, five. So these things with each five tuple are sorted. Let's suppose that this one is the median. Well, these things, these medians are smaller, right? And these medians are bigger. So this median is smaller than this median, and this median is smaller than this median, and this median is smaller. So this whole thing is, um, is S, and this chunk here is M, and we found the median of M. So that means that these are smaller than the median, these are larger than the median. Well, this is larger than this median, and this median is larger than this median, so this has to be larger than this. So all of this stuff, all of this stuff is larger than the median of M. 
And all of this stuff is smaller than the median of m. And this is at least a quarter. And this is at least this is at least a quarter of s, and this is at least a quarter of s, about. So that means the median of m is a good pivot. So and then once you have a good pivot, you can keep go going on the recursion and you don't have to worry about being unlucky. So now that gets tricky to analyze because you're recursing to find the median of M and then based on that, you're then continuing with your recursion. I'm not gonna do that because I'm totally out of time. Like way more, sorry about this. Um, the analysis in the book, I don't think you have to actually need, I don't think you can, I'm not sure you can do the, probably you can't do this analysis, solve the recursion with the master theorem. They do it in the book with induction. Um, but that's now the only, the question that remains is, okay, so we can actually pick a pivot, a good pivot in linear time. Right, so, oh, so when, you, when you solve the recurrence, it turns out that everything works out in, in linear, because you're getting, it's like, it's like you're doing quick select and you're not unlucky at any step. Um, so, so you can select the kth element in linear time in the worst case. But then you think, um, well, you can select the median and then if you can select the median, you can actually select the kth element. So why don't we do this? So quick sort, we could, if, if you can do that, you could, you could, if you can select a, a good pivot in linear time, then you can, you can run quick sort you could make quick sort deterministic. You could make it run in worst case and log in time. Why not? It's because if you do that in practice, it's actually slower than merge sort. We use quick sort because in practice it's fast. It has a lousy worst case, but in practice it's fast. If you make it have a good worst case, then it gets slow in practice. So yeah, it, so it's actually worse than running merge sort. You could just dovetail quick sort and merge sort. Um, the people do, people, I mean, there are trade-offs where like you've probably heard of middle of three, where people choose three, three things and choose the median as the pivot. Um, you can do middle of five, you can, you, you can keep going. But so the, the, the luckier you feel, the faster you can hope your quick sort is gonna run. Um, okay, so that is absolutely, wait, there's a, no, there's nothing. Um, okay, sorry, I went over time. That was a lot of stuff, but I, uh, now we're sort of done sorting, except it will come actually, like, it will actually come up again in the next lecture where we start reading algorithms. Um, uh, oh, and this, oh yeah, it is still recording. Okay, please go, don't be late for, for anything else. Um, I've lost, most of you, but thank you for hanging around until the, the bitter end. Um, cheers. Uh, could you ask a question about assignment two? Uh, yes, I can turn the um, I can turn the recording off first. Um, okay. Any other questions about this lecture? I won't. I'll try not to go over time again. But I wanted to cover sorting and counting. And now we're finished. Divide and conquer. Yay! Yay, woo, um, except for assignment two. Um, okay, I'll, I'll turning off the recording.